Uh, his name was Bidi Quash. He was born in 1831. And um, he had about six sons. And one of those sons was named uh, James or Jim Smart. But uh, Bidi Quash, uh, he didn't have no English name. And he was from the fish clan on Owasa Sea, dude named a bullhead clan. And that was the clan that he came from. And so when they had the allotment era and they had to put out people's names on there, they um, had to give him a name. So they just referred to him as the old smart man because he could speak English. And uh, then he was a clan leader and he was a storyteller too. So they used to like to listen to him and talk to him. So they used to call him the old smart man. So when he came up to get this paper, they just always referred to him as the old smart man. So they just gave him that name, smart man. And then uh, named him uh, Peter later after that. And so that became uh, his name. And then his sons, and my grandfather was one of them, they just knocked off the man part and kept the last name smart. So it was actually a smart man when they first started down there too. But that's the same story I tell my, my boys, you know, this is where my grandfather was from the fish clan and so my grandsons are from the fish clan which are teachers and philosophers and seers you know come from that particular clan there too so that's uh you know from bad river and that's my both my parents were uh, born in bad river i was born there in bad river um, sometimes they say uh i was born in a log cabin and in old odena there's a, if you go to odena there's a power ground there right behind the the power guns are brush line there. There's been an old cabin back there, and a lot of cabins at those days. But, uh, so that's where I was born to a midwife there. And my mother was born in Odena, my dad was born in Ashland. And uh, my grandparents, uh, my mother's father, he's from uh, Kiwana Bay in Lawrence, Michigan, and they had uh, Madeyosh. And so they came from there. And then my grandmother's, uh, mother she came from St. Croix in uh, Maidwiash her name was there and they, but there used to be an old boarding school that was in um, Bad River at the time and so my uh, my great grandmother my grandmother's mother they, that's where she was at she was in that boarding school in uh, St. Mary's and that's where she met uh, Henry Gordon it was actually Henry Cloud Gordon they used to have there were too many clouds and so the half of them split and took the name Gordon and the other half clipped Cloud. But uh, he remembered my grandmother and so he went and got her and brought her back. And so then she came back and lived in, in uh, Odena. And uh, so that's where all my, my, both my parents and grandparents, they all lived from there. And so that's a little bit about you know, who I am uh, there. Well, uh, I've actually got uh, several, several names uh, going all the way back to when I was 10 days old. Um, I wasn't uh, going to, to live. I, my grandmother came and uh, she put me through the lodge. Uh, she wanted me to be able to uh, find my way and because uh, I wasn't going to make it and well I'm still here <laughs> but she she named me there uh, a Madei name and so I have that identity uh, which is my life uh, I don't talk about it I live it and so my life is a translation of that identity um, also, urn names and uh, dream names, uh, Minodei Beneshi is uh, what she eventually named me in a, a ceremony. Um, and the literal translation of that is uh, Minodei. Uh, Minu is a beautiful ode, Odei, a beautiful heart. But the uh, story there um, talks about uh, a bird that will come and lift your heart. And so that's the uh, meaning of that name. Then uh, 
two eventual uh, lodge ceremonies, uh, midday ceremonies, Negwe uh, Benes, the thunderbird that brings the rainbow, and Wainim uh, Watane Gizik. Um, if the wind is blowing and you see the ripples out there going pretty strong, but you look over there and you see a calm spot, it's like there's a real calm place, but uh, this refers to a uh, uh, a clear spot. Now, if you look way over there on on the horizon, over the top of the village, in the sky over there, all these clouds, you look way over there and you see that blue sky. That's Wainiwetane Gizik. That's my name over there. So you'll see blue. Uh, probably while we're talking here, the sun will come through and shine on us. That's translation of my name. And it's, it's not so much uh, talking about it, but it's living it. Uh, and that's the way those Madea names are. As an undergraduate, I went to college and I was, uh, I was a medic while I was in the service and I was like helping people. And I was going to be a male nurse, but then I switched over to social work. I was always interested in helping people in the community. And so I got into social work. And so when I finished graduate school in Minnesota, uh, I came to, I got married. My wife is a Ho-Chunk Potawatomi. She lived down in the Wausau area. So I moved back over here and I moved down to Tomahawk. So she went 45 miles south to Wausau and I went 45 miles north to Flambeau and I uh, took a job here as a clinical social worker. And so I started working here uh, in 1984, in fall 1984. And uh, working with individuals, you start looking at the community and start looking at uh, what was going on in the community and different issues and social problems. And uh, there was also, you know, quite a bit um, alcohol, uh, drug problems at that time. Most of, a lot of alcohol at that time, there's still drugs that were here, but the alcohol was a big problem. And uh, also then, uh, so we started looking at how to help families and individuals, and individuals come from families, and so we had to take a look at programs to help families, just not individuals, but how could you get to really interact with more people than just individuals, you know, because you keep... And so when you start looking at individuals, you start to see that, uh, being trained as a social worker from a systems perspective, that looking at families, individuals come from families, and so you have to start looking at working with families, and so, because families are impact individuals and children. And uh, we also were looking at uh, in the old travel building there. There's a bunch of individuals, they're all looking out the window, and there's about eight or 10 of them there watching. So I stopped to see what they were looking at. And when I looked out with them, there was a man walking across on uh, that, field there. It was only about 30, 40 yards from the playground. All the kids were out there playing. But he was walking across there, with her, and he had her by the back of the hair. And he was walking her like a dog, you know. And he'd walk like that. And then she'd fight every now and then, and then grab her. And he'd slap her up and hit her. And then he'd grab her again, and he'd walk across the hall. And some of the individuals, you know, um, I remember a couple, men and women, you know, they said, well, that's her fault, man. That's the way she is. You know, she needs to get her butt kicked. And but they approved it. You know, it was it was sanctioned by the community. They didn't see anything wrong with it. But I seen all them kids were watching that whole process there too. And I thought, you know, that's a sanctioned type of behavior. You know, and kids are picking that up. And so now, you know, in ten years we'll be dealing with the same issues because the kids are picking it up too. And so they'll be doing some of the same things. So we start taking a look at how do you intervene within the family. And so we start taking a look at the parenting classes. And I had been involved with some before when I was in graduate school in Minnesota and a way to get, interact with family. And so we start taking a look at uh, some parenting classes. And there was two psychologists that were here, and one was named Jack Hafner. Jack was a psychologist from the University of Minnesota.
Jack Hafner. He was uh, Dr. Jack Hafner. He was a psychologist, um, retired uh, in this area, in Lake Tomahawk area. But he was from the University of Minnesota, and that's where he retired. And uh, while he was up this way, a position to open up here at the in Lac de Flambeau for a psychologist and director of the, at that time was called Behavioral Health. And Jack, when he came here and he became director, he kind of changed the name to Family Resource Center and he, he combined a lot of other um, programs that are all resources to families. So he kind of put them under one roof uh, there. And so when I came here in 1984, uh, as a clinical social worker, uh, Jack was real interested in you know, working with tribal people. But uh, Jack was real instrumental in the development of the uh, family circles, or the development being the, the basic foundation of it. So they had talked about they had started a parenting class, but uh, it started out, they'd have about eight or ten people and then after that, um, it would go like 8 or 10, 6 to 8, 5 or 6, 4 or 5, 3 or 2. Every week it got less and less. And less. So it was funny so to get there. And they started out with 8 weeks and they never finished it. And then people would just drop out. And so they tried it several different times. He said they started out with a good group and then it was just sort of, it was sort of a canned curriculum, you know. and. Uh, at the same time, you know, Bob and, you know, they're both white individuals and uh, psychologists and trying to teach it from that. And I said, well, you need to really take a look at something more culturally relevant there, too. And, uh, but to see that, that goes back further. Uh, when I was writing my master's paper, my master's thesis, uh, and I entitled that More Than Beads and Feathers, More Than Beads and Feathers. That uh, when I was working in the as a guidance counselor in the uh, Ojibwe school in uh, Fond du Lac Reservation, um, one of the things there that was to always to bring culture into the school or bring culture into social services that uh, tribal people could recognize. But I but I had also seen that you know years of uh, the bureau of social workers would come, bureau of health people. And they would rotate, you know, they'd come there for, you know, six months, a year, a year and a half or something, and then they'd rotate out. They were just constantly doing that continuously. And they're always doing the same thing, you know, and that was always the assimilation process that was always going on was how to take Indian people and, you know, make them better white people, you know, by giving them more better curriculum or teach them that particular way. And, and all our systems were always built upon that. And then when you took a look at culture, it was sort of marginalized. But the main paradigm of educational thought was always the Eurocentric Western philosophy and educational and social service. Everything was that was the main paradigm. And culture was always marginalized. And they marginalized it like, you know, we'd decorate things, we'll put some feathers up and maybe some couple of pictures of Indian people or something. And that was about the extent of culture. You know, they really didn't want to have anything really incorporated in there. So. And that's what I entitled the, the, my thesis is more than beads and feathers. There's much more deeper components uh, about that. And so Jack, in our discussions on a weekly basis, we would go over that. And so I also asked Jack to, um, I had to do, finish the, the final draft of my paper, and then we would talk about therapeutically how we could sort of use those particular intervention teaching things to help families within the community. And Jack would always encourage any time that I would suggest a therapeutic cultural perspective, he said, well, I'll try it. You know, and it, everything else has been tried. Uh, it fits within that therapeutic milieu of helping and intervention. And uh, so go ahead. And so he was very supportive of that, you know, and uh, he wasn't questioning it. He just uh, encouraged to do more of it. And so what I did is I did a survey and I went around and I asked him if we had to teach culture, and that was part of what the school was about too, if we had to teach that, what would, what would you teach? Where would you start? And so I interviewed a lot of tribal people, elders, people in language, educators, um, general community people, and to see where we were starting. They all, depending where they were at culturally, you know, some who were very traditional would say, we got to start with language, and that's the, that's the important part of their 
some were bicultural, and maybe some different about, um, I don't know about history, uh, some about cultural aspects, and sometimes hunting and fishing. And so there, all, there was a whole different perspective about where to start. And you know, one old man said, well, he was from Fond du Lac, and he said, well, I may start with powwows, he said, you know, because it's safe for people. Uh, they can come there and just you know, learn as much as they want, just come as many, go as many polls as they want, and it's uh, not as threatening uh, them. Because there's always been that shame-based uh, perspective among many tribal people about the fact that they didn't know anything about their culture and about their language, and sometimes white people would come up and ask them, and they, they wouldn't know. So they would just say, oh, no, you know, we don't do that anymore, you know, but it was kind of double shame base for them, you know, on one sense they wanted to know it, but since they didn't know it. And, you know, the, the Bureau and the government did a really good job of assimilating a lot of tribal people and getting rid of language and the cultural aspects. And many people just left the culture and, you know, went to become more white, you know, that's how they lived their life, you know, that was how they did things. And uh, when I was growing up, that was pretty much, you know, that was, everybody was doing it, you know, that was, Used to, I was just a friend of mine, he's from uh, um, Red Cliff. His name's Andy Golkin. Andy passed away, what, two years ago. But he was talking to some people and he, he brought up an old term I hadn't heard in a long time. And he said, uh, some people asked him, said, don't be so Indianish. And I thought, oh, I forgot about that, man. I remembered that. They used to use that word, Indian people would use among themselves, you know. So, don't be so Indianish, and don't be so Indian, you know, be more white. But they would always say that, you know, don't be so Indianish, you know. Uh, everybody's trying to be more white, you know, and just take on those characteristics and culture and put them on the side. And so that was happening. I'd seen that quite a bit happening. But also people wanted to be, you know, tribal people were still interested in uh, who they are. And a lot of things were going on in the 70s and early 80s, you know, when you get all the Civil Rights Act and come, people wanted to try to be uh, Indian again. They wanted to learn more about themselves. And so now you got lots of people trying to relearn and about their language and their history and things. And so I said, that's, that's the direction that the tribes are going, you know. So we need to incorporate that into all the things that we do, our educational system, our social service system, our legal system. You know, we need to incorporate that in there because people can recognize that and they want to learn that. So because, in, and so we get back to the parenting, the parenting was based for white people, you know, and so they get in there and look at it and, and it's all talks about white people and their examples and different things and nothing really related to them. And so they would just sort of fizzle out, you know, and they wouldn't come back anymore. So, so that tied to how do we get the parenting program to be more culturally relevant? you know, to the tribal people. And I was looking at this parenting curriculum and this individual kind of used it in a community. And in that community, he kind of put the streets of the community that he was working in. He kind of drew, had some drawings, and he put the streets in there. And I thought, you know, that's what we could do here, you know. So we kind of did that. We took some pictures we had, and we went around, took some of the streets in Flambo, and we wrote down some of those names that were streets around here. We put them pictures in there, so when people look at the creek, I mean, they'd see that name, they'd recognize that street, they'd recognize that, and it's, they make a connection to it. And I met a guy named Terry Cross, and Terry, he runs the uh, National uh, Child Welfare Association out in Portland, Oregon. It's a little national organization now. But he was just getting started. He was looking for parenting curriculum too. I remember, I remember meeting him out there because we were kind of talking about it, and there was nothing nothing available. There was nothing that was really culturally relevant. So that started the process of how do we make the, the, the curriculum more culturally relevant to you know people in Lac de Flambeau. My brother Ernie was one of the ones, the individual that um, had gathered information for to teach uh, grade school culture within the grade school system. Everybody calls me Uncle Ernie. Um, and the reason for that is that um, we have a responsibility, uh, our roles as men in our community and in our tribe is, is to be an uncle. And I uh, always uh, 
hope to do things with my life that you will always look at me as your uncle. But the important thing is that you uh, would, I, my purpose is for you to say, uh, I want my boys to be like him. And you tell your boys, see what he's doing, watch him. And that's our role as men in our community. Um, and that's the way I take the role. But then at the same time, uh, if your boys are doing anything that they shouldn't be doing, it's my responsibility to not to be mean, but to show them right, uh, show them the right way. And uh, when they're being good and helping their little brother and little sister over there, I, I sure let them know and, and teach them things, you know, every bit that I can. And I, gee, hardly even know them, but yet they were like my little nephews. So that's our responsibility. And uh, uh, hopefully you never have to say to your boys, oh, I'm going to go tell uncle. <laughs> when, we were, when we were growing up, we never wanted to hear that. Um, we always wanted to please our uncles. And that's the way my grandma and grandpa taught us. Um, always, always do good. So in the morning, when you get up, uh, grandpa's always up and he's making oatmeal. And my goal in life was to get up before grandpa, to be up before him. And I, in my lifetime, I never accomplished that. <laughs> to, to this day, I'm an early riser, and I, I just have never been able to to sleep past uh, before dawn. I, I just not able to do it. I always awake, and it's that habit of uh, wanting to be up just once before him, and never he's he's up making oatmeal. And if on the previous day, if I was really, really good, um, he would make that oatmeal, and my grandma would serve it and bring it in there, and that bowl there'd be a a clump of maple sugar. Oh man, that that's a symbol of, of saying, uh, "Oh, you did good." I really, really, I enjoyed. And tomorrow morning, your boys, I would. I would put maple sugar on their oatmeal because they're, they're being so good. And then we start looking at, you know, more time with him. And then we kind of rearranged a grant to bring him in. So then we asked him just to, if he would move back here. And he said, well, what do you think of my life? This is my wife. So he did. Sunrises were amazing looking at Mount Hood as we came east down into Portland. And one morning the cloud cover was kind of low and it was uh, clear behind Mount Hood and just the tip of Mount Hood was sticking up in the clouds and so you couldn't see the top of Mount Hood but the sun was coming up behind Mount Hood and the, sh the shadow of the mountain, the tip came all the way across the sky and you could see that shadow in a, in a line coming all the way across and it came right over the top of us and just a stripe in the sky coming across and <clears throat> I said to my wife uh, we got to go home and she says why do you say that and I said, because it's one of my uh, mentors, one of my teachers, um, Besha Gizik from Flambeau, the greatest storyteller I ever knew, uh, Bob Link, his name was Besha Gizik, uh, striped in the sky. Um, you know, he's no longer living, I said, but Look at, there he is, telling us we need to come home. 
So then we started the curriculum writing. So then, then my brother and I, we, do, we sat down with all the material and then we started to do the writing. And uh, we spent a lot of time um, really uh, stories because all the whole curriculum is based on stories. You know, that was all was related to us with stories. Uh, one of the things when we were interviewing older people, we were, we were thinking in Chamok terms. We'd say, okay, can you tell me how to do it like step one, step two, step three, step four, or the order of how you go about doing it, you know, and they'd say, yeah, okay. Then they'd tell you a story. They'd say, that's a good story, but and you can just tell us, you know, how would you do it like, you know, first thing you would do, then the second thing you would do, and we'd see, we're thinking, learn your Chamoke ways. And we kept doing that, and finally, we finally got to what they were telling us. They'd go back and tell us another story, you know, another story, you know. You know it's like one of the older men, he's from, uh, it's about Pipe Mustache. I was thinking about that. We were recording them there that time, and with that microphone, Oh, I'll finish that story too, but Mike, you know, and what Pipe did too is he he, he hit that little microphone, he hit a rock like that, and he kept looking at it, and finally he goes, that was about right, part he goes, boom, he hits it really hard, and the Marilyn just jumped in like that, and she turned around, she blamed me, you know, for doing it, I said, well, that, that was him, don't play that old man again, now. I know you're doing that. And Marilyn was a cultural educator too, uh, very strong in the cultural ways and beliefs as was her father. And so I approached Marilyn about coming over and we had actually brought her over uh, a few times in our parenting classes to speak through the Children's Trust Fund. So she came in and talked on a few topics uh, periodically when she was here and she was doing some work on domestic violence too. So when she was here, we would use her. So that's how I became aware of the things that she was doing. So that when we, looking at cultural comes, I contacted her again if she wanted to do more of it. Because uh, we were just bringing her in every now and then, but we wanted to spend more time. And uh, she did, and she came over, and so she became our first uh, consultant, uh, cultural consultant. That Marilyn, when she came in, was very critical uh, in the process of interviewing the elders uh, talking to them about living away a certain way of life and uh, then her involvement in curriculum development and but she had a lot of energy she had lots of uh, good ideas and uh, just meeting people and so that was very helpful so she's very critical in that first uh, days of uh, interaction I had a lot of other things to do with the program but it kind of she allowed I allowed me to do other different types of things but she would you know, bring in, uh, talk about elders and on a weekly basis, who we could bring in and when we'd bring them in, or we'd go to them too. We would travel to those places and uh, she would coordinate and set that up and we would do the videotaping, uh, audio taping, or just in, you know, interviews. And a lot of times I'd be sitting in a lodge and sitting on the ground and I'd see an ant come walking by and I'd, I'd watch the ant or two ants fighting there, you know, and they're talking about specific things. and. I'm just watching the two little ants fight there, you know, and I'm not paying really close attention. But they talk a long time in those in the stories. But he, Pipe says, <clears throat> you want to know about the secret of life? Everybody kind of looked at him, and then he stopped talking Indian, Indian and then he started talking English. He said, you want to know the secret of life? He was standing up and he had his cane. He looked at everybody and he said, you want to know the secret of life? And comes there. They point the cane at him. You want to know the secret of life? You want to know the secret? It's like, oh, Pipe been in the medicine lodge 88 years and they tell us the secret of life. You really got to listen to that. Everybody's sitting in there. And he tell a story. Everybody's listening. <laughs> Do you want to know what the secret of life is? Do you? Do you? Everybody's sitting there and they say, tell me, you want to know? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. <coughs> he was standing up. Looked at everybody. And he goes. And he sat down. And he said, "Hang in there." 
<laughs> and that was it. And everybody was sitting there like, where's the magic bullet, you know? And But if he was listening to the story, the stories, he was talking about, don't give up. You need to hang in there. It's going to get hard. Life's going to get hard and difficult, but you want to hang, you want to give up, but you don't, you hang in there. He's talking about relationships and families and different things, all kinds of different things. He said, just when you think you can't take it no more, I said, hang in there. You hang in there. You know, you hang in there. And that's what the story was about. You just hang in there. Hang in there with your children, you hang with your relationships, hang with your work, and hang in life. And, you know, it gets a little difficult, but just hang in there and you'll get through it. And that's what those stories were about. And so by talking with elders and talking together, uh, Sonny and I, we understood that that journey begins uh, with understanding yourself. So it has to begin with ourselves. Uh, we have to uh, begin to understand where, you know, where we are here. And uh, I've asked the question many times, uh, who's the most important person in the whole world? In your world, who's the most important person to you? Mm -hmm. What if I tell you that's not the right answer? It'd be hard to do, isn't it? Hard to convince you of that. Mm -hmm. But yet, there's a more important answer. Okay. Yeah. If I were to tell you that you don't have it in you to love anybody else more than you can love yourself, then you have to get at the business of learning how to love yourself. And a lot of people come from very difficult lives that they eventually decide that because they've been treated so bad that nobody cares, that they're worthless. And it's very difficult to treat anybody with kindness and respect and love and tenderness and sharing if you can't do that for yourself. So that's where our curriculum began and we built from there. So that's kind of uh, uh, how we came about uh, developing the program. Took us five years. It didn't happen overnight, that's for sure. But for Sunday night, it, it took a lot uh, of us uh, dealing with a lot of things, loss, uh, um, trauma in our lives. And we talked it through. Uh, a lot of healing took place for both of us. You know, in order for us to talk about it and and teach it and write about it, we had to understand it ourselves. So it was a long road. But uh, Marilyn was very critical, you know, in that early early days of development. I wanted to acknowledge uh, her involvement, uh, her and Jack involvement, as well as Larry and Mick Smallwood. Uh, very critical pieces of uh, information gathering, uh, getting things set, and those individuals were very critical. So I wanted to recognize uh, those individuals. And one of the other individuals who was also talking in here is uh, my brother Ernie. And so Ernie was brought in as a consultant, very similar to Marilyn. And uh, he has continued on to do the writing, so he's acknowledged in that whole process. But uh, Marilyn has passed away. Uh, about 20 years ago now, I think she had, and Jack, uh, just recently, about four or five years ago, he had passed away. He had retired from here and moved to Madison. So, unfortunately, you know, he hasn't seen some of the, uh, his contributions that, I never got a really chance to tell you that, but I wanted people to know that his contributions 
and what he did for the Family Circles program and developed into his guidance and allowed us to be able to uh, get this far. So I wanted to just express uh, those uh, words uh, towards Jack and Marilyn and Amik, who has just passed away a few years ago also. Uh, those individuals again being very critical uh, in the things that we were doing and developing and uh, getting to this point uh, with the Family Circles revitalization. I'm going to say about that much for those individuals. Thank you. Miigwech. Oh.